In this lesson, we're continuing our discussion of performance, and specifically, we want to focus on conditions, excuses, and anticipatory repudiation. In case you're wondering where we are in the big picture flow of our contracts analysis, we're moving past the W to the C, the E, and the A, and Sarah plays with cats every afternoon. Of course, the C, the E, and the A stand for conditions, excuses, and anticipatory repudiation. So why are we bundling these three concepts in one video, right? The idea here is conditions, excuses, and anticipatory repudiation really all go to this second question. Remember when we said we were looking at a performance analysis, there's really two questions. What performance is due and is any performance discharged? Well, our first lessons focused more on the first question, right? We were thinking about substantial performance versus perfect tender, the parole evidence rule. In warranties, we were more so focused on defining what performance is due on under the contract. What are the legal duties the parties are obligated to perform here? Now, we had some overlap with this second question, but we were more so focused on this first question. Right now, in this video, right, when we're thinking about conditions, excuses, and anticipatory repudiation, we're really moving on and thinking more so about this second part of our performance analysis, whether any performance can be discharge, where the non-performance of that legal duty will be excused, right? So we can start with conditions, okay? And the, the first thing to recognize with the conditions analysis, and really what a conditions analysis always boils down to, is this gateway question, right? What's the difference between a condition and a promise? And the easy way I like to think about this is that a promise creates a legal duty, a condition does not, right? Every contract has to have at least one promise in it. Even unilateral contracts, at minimum, have to contain at least one promise, right? Promises create legal duties, right? And what's the effect of not performing a promise under the contract, right? If you fail to perform a legal duty under the contract, we know that results in breach of contract, right? On the other hand, a condition alters a promise in some way, it usually either expands or limits a promise, right? And what is the effect of a condition? Will the non-occurrence of a condition result in performance being discharged, right? A duty under the contract is usually now going to be discharged when we have non-occurrence of a condition. So non-performance of a promise, we're thinking breach of contract. Non-occurrence of a condition, we're thinking performance discharge, right? And that's the important distinction to recognize, right? And usually a promise always, right? A promise creates a legal duty. A condition then comes along and somehow alters an already existing legal duty. It alters the promise. So, for example, right, and we can start with express conditions because these are very easy to see, right? Imagine that we have the purchase and sale of a home, right? I offer to purchase a home from you for $200,000, right? Well, if you convey the home to me and I start living in it and I never pay you the $200,000, what is that, right? That's a breach of contract. I promised to pay you $200,000. I never fulfilled my promise. That result is a breach of contract, right? The promise created a legal duty, my legal duty to pay you $200,000, my failure to perform that promise, fulfill that legal duty of paying you $200,000 now results in a breach of contract, right? Now, if we add a condition to the promise, right? What does that look like and what does that do? What's our effect now? Well, let's say that I say I'm going to buy a house from you for $200,000 on the condition that I can get approved for a loan, right? Now let's say that I go out in good faith and try to get approved for a loan, but no bank will have me, I can't get the loan, right? So we have non-occurrence of a condition, I fail to pay you, right? Non-performance now of a promise, can you sue me for breach of contract? 
No, right? Because now we have a condition. And the non-occurrence of a condition discharges duties under the contract. So because we said, I'm only going to pay you $200,000 on the condition that I can get approved for a loan, that condition never occurred. I was never approved for a loan. So now my duty to pay you $200,000 is discharged. I'm no longer liable for breach of contract for not paying you. So you can see that a condition is usually a way to mitigate risk in a contract or at least shift risk in a contract. That's usually why we're using conditions and they usually, right, or always are affecting an already existing promise. So very critical to recognize the difference between a condition and a promise and the effect of a condition and a promise because this is usually where students are going to get tripped up in a condition analysis because the rest of this, when you understand what a condition looks like and what a promise looks like and the difference that they have, right, the different effect that they have, the rest of it's pretty straightforward, right? Because you know, so we can start with express conditions, right? Express conditions are obviously pretty easy to see. There has to be conditional language in the fact pattern to indicate you have an express condition. You want to look for things like only if or provided that or on the condition that or in the event that blank happens, right? Whatever it is, you got to see some sort of conditional language to have an express condition. So, you know, I'll buy this home from you on the condition that I can get approved for financing or in the event that I can get approved for financing or only if I get approved for financing or provided that I get approved for financing, right? You got to have some type of conditional language. And again, non-occurrence of an express condition is going to result in performance discharge, not breach of contract, right? That's the key to recognize. So that's pretty easy to see, right? And so one of the next questions is, well, what is satisfaction of a condition, right? Because the analysis, remember we said when we were defining how do you determine whether or not performance has been completed, right? Or whether a legal duty has been performed, right? What was the test? We said it was substantial performance versus perfect tender, right? When we're talking about conditions, we know it's not a promise analysis like substantial performance versus perfect tender. We're applying a different analysis to determine whether we have satisfaction of a condition. And the good news with satisfaction of conditions is that it's usually pretty easy to see, especially if we have express conditions, right? It's very binary. Some courts will say that conditions have to be strictly satisfied. Other courts will say it's whether a reasonable person would be satisfied. You know, the, but the ultimate, you know, idea here is it's usually pretty binary. Either you got approved for financing or you didn't, right? It either rained or it didn't, right? Whatever your condition was, it either usually happened or it didn't. There's not a whole lot of variance there. The only time you can really see satisfaction of a condition at issue is when the condition is based on someone's personal taste, aesthetic, or personal satisfaction, right? You commission someone to paint a painting for you, right? And you agree to pay them $5,000 for a painting on the condition that you're personally satisfied with the painting, right? So what do you do there? How do you determine whether or not that condition occurred? Because non-occurrence of that condition, we know discharges performance. So when the painting is completed, under the traditional approach, what we'll say is it's actually just a subjective test with good faith being the limitation. So if this person honestly in their heart of hearts in good faith is dissatisfied, that's non-occurrence of a condition that they had to be satisfied that discharges their duty to pay. Right now, the more modern approach and what's reflected in the second restatement in those cases is more going to be objective. What would a reasonable person under like circumstances have thought? Would a reasonable person be satisfied or not, right? So traditional approach, it's more subjective with the limitation being good faith, right? You can't just lie, but that's difficult to prove right in court, but you know, possible if you have an email or a text message like, oh, I secretly love this painting, but I'm going to tell them I don't, right? Well, that's not subjective good faith, 
Right, and then though, remember the modern approach would be more reasonable. Another way to look at it and what some courts handle with this personal satisfaction test is if it's more about aesthetic or taste, like whether or not you are pleased with artwork, they're more willing to apply the traditional approach. But if it's more about function or utility, probably more so inclined to apply the modern approach of reasonableness. So if you're having your car repaired, right, you pay an auto technician $500 to replace your bumper, right? And on the condition that you're going to be satisfied with their work, right? I'll pay you $500 if you replace my bumper on the condition that I'm satisfied with your work, right? In that case, a court is going to be more inclined to apply the modern approach and say, would a reasonable person be satisfied? Because this isn't about aesthetics or taste as much as it is about functionality or utility, right? So just some things to keep in mind there with satisfaction if you see kind of a personal satisfaction fact pattern. But otherwise, the occurrence or non-occurrence of a condition will usually be pretty easy to see. It either happened or it didn't, usually going to be pretty binary. So. Again, that's more of what a uh, express condition analysis looks like. You also have this concept of constructive conditions, right? And really, constructive conditions is a huge wormhole in contract law that you can dive down. But from my experience, it is not something that is very often tested in law school and the bar exam. So we'll just do a brief coverage of constructive conditions and move on, right? The main idea here with constructive conditions. And by the way, a constructive condition is obviously a condition that's being implied in all contracts, right? So, you know, off the top, you have some like the implied duty of good faith and fair dealing. When you enter into a contract, you have an implied or constructive condition imposed on you to act in good faith and deal fairly, right? So there's some constructive conditions like that that you can see, but the main one we have is this idea of the constructive condition of exchange, which basically just means when one party performs, there's a constructive condition implied in the contract that the other party now has to perform, you know? And the classic example I think about here is, you know, interactions I've had with my nieces, right? It would be very common for something like this to unfold with my niece, right? So say I'm eating an ice cream bar and my niece sees this and she comes up to me and she says, hey, Uncle Mike, if you give me your ice cream bar, I will pay you $5. And I say, okay, sure, good deal, here you go. Of course, she takes the ice cream bar you know, runs off with it and eats it and never pays me. Well, if I tried to sue her for breach of contract, she comes to court, she might argue something like, oh yeah, sure, I promised I was gonna pay him $5, but I never said when I was gonna pay him. I could pay him next week, a year from now, five years from now, I'll pay him. I never specified when, right? You know, something like that. You kind of hear this from children and stuff, that kind of thought process happening. The reason, amongst many reasons, that wouldn't work in court is this idea of the constructive condition of exchange. When I performed, right, I gave my niece the ice cream bar, she had a constructive condition to return, right? She had a constructive condition to return performance and pay me the $5. Right? She can't argue, even though we never expressly said when performance was due, it's going to be imposed in the contract as a constructive condition, right? So really the only question we have here when we're dealing with the constructive condition of exchange is this idea of order of performance, right? Who has to perform first? So if you think about that, if me and my niece are talking and she says, if you give me the dry or <laughs> She says something like, you know, if you give me your ice cream sandwich, I'll pay you $5, right? And we don't really specify, well, who has to do what first? Do I have to give her the dry or do I have to give her the ice cream bar or does she have to pay me first, right? The second restatement of contracts kind of deals with this section 234 is what most courts are going to apply. And the idea here is if there's no real time requirement needed, no time period necessary to perform something like that, I'm going to hand you an ice cream bar and in exchange, you're gonna hand me a $5 bill. It's 
since neither of those performances really require any period of time to complete, we say actually the order of performance is simultaneous, right? In a perfect world, in contract law perfect world, my niece and I would exchange the ice cream bar and the $5 at the exact same time, right? That's what section 234 wants when neither performance requires a period of time to complete. We say the order of performance needs to be simultaneous, right? Now, if one performance requires a period of time to perform and the other doesn't, you know, you go to the barber to get a haircut, right? For him to perform his duty under the contract, give you the haircut, that takes a period of time. Your performance paying the 30 bucks or whatever it is doesn't require any time. Who has to go first? There we say it's the party whose duty requires a period of time to perform. So the barber has to perform per first and then you have to pay. And typically in real world situations, this is what you see. Anywhere you go to have a service performed, that's usually the order of performance. Right? You go to have your car repaired, right? You drop the car off, they fix it, then you pay them. You go to the barber, you get your hair cut, then you pay them, right? You go somewhere to have a service performed, usually the service is performed first, then you pay. This would be in alignment with the second restatement, which is what most courts are going to apply there. The big caveat here though is, the parties can contract otherwise and most of the time they do, right? If the circumstances or the contract indicates otherwise, that's fine. So the parties can say, look, you're gonna pay me $5 down, you're going to pay me $10 in the middle of this haircut and $10 at the end, right? If they actually contracted out, that would be acceptable, right? So you can alter the order of performance in the contract. But again, right, long-winded, probably a little bit unnecessary to worry about too much. Constructive condition of exchange is pretty intuitive, right? If you perform your side, the other side has to perform as well, right? Pretty easy to understand, but that's really the main idea we see with constructive conditions. Also the duty to you know, act in good faith uh, as a constructive condition, you can sometimes see just always, it's a good one to keep in the back of your mind at all times in contract law. Anytime you're looking at a fact pattern, it's always a good thing to throw in as a little bonus to rack up other points. If you see someone doing something you know, untoward, you can always argue bad faith, breach of the implied or constructive condition to act fairly in good faith and deal fairly. You know, something you can keep in the back of your mind, but no real elemental requirements to worry about. That's just something, again, I would throw in if you see it, but not to worry about too much, right? Constructive conditions is not a highly tested issue. So again, with conditions, we are focused more on express conditions if you see conditional language in the fact pattern. Something like only if, provided that, or on the condition that. And remember, the effect here, right, and this is just a different way of saying it, but the non-occurrence of a condition is going to discharge performance. So to avoid discharge of performance, a condition must be satisfied unless the condition is excused. And we already talked about satisfaction. Remember, it's binary. Usually you can see it very easily. Either the condition happened or it didn't, unless you're dealing with something of aesthetics or personal taste. Remember, we talked about the test there. So the one last thing to really think about with conditions is this idea that conditions themselves like performance can be excused. We have the main four ones that you see tested here on the board, right? There's the idea of waiver, right? A person or a party to a contract can waive a condition by words or conduct, right? And by conduct, normally that's through election and estoppel, which we'll talk about in a minute, but by words, you can waive a condition. So you can simply say, you know, if I agree to purchase a home for $200,000 on the condition that I get approved for financing, you know, I can, I'm free to waive that condition. I can call up the seller and say, hey, look, don't worry about that condition. I'd like to move forward without it, right? I'm waiving that condition by my words, right? Which is allowed. So now I can't go back and say, hey, look, I didn't get approved for financing. I don't owe you any money. I waived that condition. It's now excused under the contract. The other big one here that we want to think about is wrongful hindrance or wrongful, uh, wrongful hindrance, right? So wrongful hindrance would be the idea where we have 
you know, and we kind of talked about this with good faith, right? So the idea here would be if I say, you know, we can stick with the same example that I am going to purchase a home for $200,000 on the condition that I get approved for a loan. Well, I actually have to go out in good faith and try to get a loan. If I try to wrongfully hinder or interfere with that condition, you know, because I want to get out of the contract, I want my duty to perform discharge, that's not going to work. That's a wrongful hindrance. So if the agreement is, I'm going to pay you $200,000 on the condition that I can get approved for a loan and then I intentionally, in bad faith, make sure I don't get approved for a loan, right? That's wrongful hindrance. That's going to excuse the condition. I can no longer enforce that condition in court to have my performance discharged. Right? I'm still going to owe you the money if I do that, right? Election is kind of like waiver by conduct. This would be if a party basically just elects to perform anyways, even though we have non-occurrence of a condition. So if I offer or we agree that I'm going to pay $200,000 on the condition that I get approved for financing, and I just pay you the $200,000 even though I don't get approved for financing, I'm by election waiving, by election to perform anyways, I'm waiving this condition, right? So the condition is going to be excused. I can't later try to enforce this condition to have my duty to perform discharged, right? And then similar to this, we have the idea of estoppel. If one party tells the other party that they're not going to enforce a condition and the other party reasonably relies on that representation, right? We're going to say now the party who made the representation is going to be is, is stopped from enforcing that condition to have their performance discharged. So in our example, if I tell a moving company, hey, look, I'm about to get this new house on the condition that I get approved for financing, I promise to pay you $5,000 to move all of my furniture, right? Well, let's say I call them the next day and say, hey, you know what, let's just get on with the move. I'm gonna get approved for financing. Don't worry about that condition. I'm not going to enforce it. So they rely on that representation and they, you know, incur some expenses to get the moving truck ready and they start to move furniture or whatever, I'm now going to be stopped from enforcing that condition to have my duty to pay them discharged because they relied on my representation that I was not going to enforce the condition of financing or getting a loan, right? So again, just some ways that you can have a condition excuse Right, and the main two are waiver and wrongful hindrance or wrongful interference. And election and estoppel are kind of like waiver by conduct, right? So just to remember that in the back of your mind, a condition, the non-occurrence of a condition will discharge performance unless the condition has actually been excused. Which is a great segue to our next topic for ways that performance can be discharged. And that's with actual excuses, which are actual doctrines, right? We have the doctrine of impossibility or the doctrine of impracticability. It's called both ways by different courts and the doctrine of frustration of purpose. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap.
Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.